We come now to what feels like the end of a long and labyrinthine journey through all sorts of contexts and concepts and uh, all sorts of uh, distinctions and false starts and we ought to go this way instead of going this way and here's where Western metaphysics has gone on Heidegger's part in this, this uh, work, the origin of the work of art. Now we're actually going to get to the origin We've gotten the essence of the work of art, which is to, to set forth truth and to create a, or bring forth a, a world and earth which exist in strife with each other. We've managed to distinguish uh, all sorts of different improperly applied concepts of the thingly nature of the work. Now we're getting close to the end and we are actually close to the end of the, the last section that we were looking at. The, the art and truth, and now we're switching to talk about yet another new concept, createdness. What is it to create? What is it to be a creator? What is it to be created? What is creation? So Heidegger says, and I'm going to pick up where we left off with the last video, we now indeed grasp the essence of truth more clearly in certain respects. What is now, what is at work, work in the work may accordingly have become clear, but the work's now visible work being still does not tell us anything about the work's closest and most obtrusive reality, the thingly aspect of the work. And why is this the closest and most obtrusive reality? Well, remember, when we talked about uh, earth and world, um, the earth is that which shelters, that which, which conceals, that which juts forth into the world, which is revealed by the work, the world, which uh, in the artwork first takes on its, its luminosity, its intelligibility. It creates a space of openness. And the material aspects of the work of art, whether they be tones of music, whether they be color in a painting, whether they be the stone, the wood, the gold of a temple, whether they be the very language itself that's being used in a, a work of poetry, or the bodies of the actors, the masks in ancient tragedy. All of those are part of earth in the artwork. So all of those are part of the thingly aspect of the work. And he says, Indeed, it almost seems as though in pursuing the exclusive aim of grasping the world's independence as purely as possible, we'd overlook the one thing. The work is always a work, which means it is something affected, something created. Since the work is created and creation requires a medium out of which and in which it creates, the thingly element enters into the work. There will always be this interplay of, of earth and world, not only because that is demanded for the advent of truth in the work, but because there always has to be a thingly element of which the work is composed, and that is always going to take us to, to earth, take us to ground, so to speak. So he says, the question remains, how does being created belong to the work? He says, this can be elucidated only if two points are cleared up. So he's setting himself an agenda here. First, what do being created and creation mean here in distinction from making and being made? Good question. We have a pretty good conception of different modes of making and being made. Is there something different about the artwork? Second, what is the inmost essence of the work itself from which alone can be gauged how far createdness belongs to the work and how far it determines the work being, the kind of being that it is of the work. So he says, creation is here always thought in reference to the work. So put aside, um, you know, Jewish, Christian, Muslim conceptions of creation, particularly creation ex nihilo. Um, Heidegger has something, some, something quite different in mind. He says, to the essence of the work belongs the happening of truth. From the outset, we, de we define the essence of creating by its relation to the essence of truth as the unconcealment of beings. The pertinence of createdness to the work can be elucidated only by a more fundamental clarification of what? The essence of truth. And that's why I have this schema here. Uh, it should be familiar to you from the other videos if you've, if you've seen them. And if you um, want to know more about this, there's also the video on the essence of truth itself, 
which goes into greater detail about this interplay between the concealing and unconcealing. So Heidegger is going to frame this at the very end of this section in terms of happening. We talked about this a little bit before. Now it's going to finally come into its own. What is truth that it can happen as, or even must happen as, art? How is it that there is art at all? So he says, all right, let's, let's begin again. Art is at the origin of the artwork and the artist. Origin is the providence of the essence in which the being of the being essentially unfolds. We've had this before as, as origin. Origin means, you know, where the essence is coming from, so we need to look at the essence. We need to do metaphysics. What is art? Well, we looked at the essence of art. We looked in the actual work. And that led us to truth. And truth led us to the strife between earth and world. And, as, and uh, like he says, repose happens in the concentrated agitation of this striving. You know, for somebody who, who rejects Hegel's dialectics, Heidegger is an awfully dialectical uh, thinker as far as his stylistics go. So he says, the self-composure of the work is, is grounded here. So in the work, the happening of truth is at work. But what is thus at work is so in the work. This is all within the work. So, you know, to, to take a few examples, if a, if a music piece, a symphony, for example, is a Heideggerian work of art, this strife between world and earth, the, the, the play between openness and unconcealment, concealing, the double concealment that occurs, the concealment of, a, of concealment, the concealing within beings and of beings, even in the open space, all of that is happening within the, the work of art, which is, which is, you know, in the sense of a, a piece of music being played again, um, something which has many creators, um, all of whom are, are working, at, uh, hopefully, in more or less tandem with each other. So he says, um, the actual work is here already presupposed as the bearer of the happening of this. At once the problem of the thingly feature of the work again confronts us. What is, what is this stuff that the works are made of? One thing finally becomes clear, he says. However zealously we inquire into the work's self-sufficiency, we'll fail to find its actuality as long as we don't agree to take the work as something worked as effective, as produced by somebody. So, how are we going to understand this process of creation? And he says, um, let's think about creation as bringing forth. Now, does that solve the problem for us? No. Because other things count as bringing forth as well. The creation of equipment, for example. So, off camera for a moment. This is equipment. This is not a work of art. This is an iPhone. This is technology. This does not produce the strife between world and earth and open up to us an entire region of truth. It could mediate that sort of thing. It could be a tool for us to do that sort of thing. But it doesn't by itself represent anything like that. Somebody made that. Somebody created that. And there was a lot of creation involved in this. There was the design, there was, you know, the creation of all the component parts, the apps, putting it together, imagining this entire um, way of life that goes along with, with the iPhone. Yet all of that is merely equipment for Heidegger. So, um, creation is bringing forth, making of equipment is bringing forth, handicraft. You know, you can't find an iPhone, and you couldn't have an iPhone that was made of, you know, wood and stone and made by some artisanal practitioner who had, you know, learned his craft at the hands of, you know, some master off in some rural area. That's not the kind of thing it is. But we do have other things that, that aspire to that. Um, handicraft is not the same thing as works of art. There's different types of making, different types of creating going on here. He says, it's as difficult to track down the essential features of the creation of works and the making of equipment as it is to distinguish verbally between the two modes of bringing forth. 
we find the same procedure in the activity of potter and sculptor, of joiner and painter. The creation of a work requires craftsmanship. Great artists prize craftsmanship most highly. They are the first to call for its painstaking cultivation based on complete mastery. They, above all others, constantly take pains to educate themselves ever anew in thorough craftsmanship. And so the Greeks had a word that they used very indiscriminately for the, the skill or the, the whatever it is that the creator or the maker or the shaper had, and they called it techne, the word from which we get technology. Which, by the way, interestingly, first use of the word technology, um, or its cognate, occurs in Aristotle, and there he is actually talking about people who write textbooks, people who write textbooks on rhetoric, uh, in particular. So, um, he says, it seems advisable to define the essence of creative work in terms of its craft aspect. But in reference to the linguistic, but reference to the linguistic usage of the Greek must give us some pause. We have to be careful. Oftentimes, we think if we just you know trace the words back and like put some Greek or Latin words up on, on the, the board, only Greek, of course, for Heidegger, because Latin is you know always derivative for him. We solve the matter. Heidegger is saying, eh, back up there, hold on a second. Is this really what we want to focus on? Is techne going to be the answer to our riddle here? So he says, techne signifies neither craft nor art. That would be kind of an interesting thing to say to people who study Greek, wouldn't it? Because that's oftentimes how we translate it. Not at all the technical in our present day sense either. It's not technique, it's not technology. It never means a kind of practical performance. So what does it mean? He says, it denotes a type of or a mode of knowing. And that is exactly how Aristotle actually uses the term techne. And Plato in, you know, is sort of referring to it in similar senses. Aristotle is using the word techne like that in Nicomachean Ethics Book 6, where he's, he's actually looking at techne most exclusively. And when he talks about the, the art of rhetoric, the tech, you know, hey, techne, uh, rhetorike, that seems to be what he has in mind, a mode of knowing. To know means to have seen, which means to apprehend what is present. For Greek thought, the essence of knowing consists in aletheia, revelation, openness of beings. It supports and guides comportment towards beings. Techne is a bringing forth of beings in that it brings forth what is present and is as such out of concealment and into the unconcealment of its appearance. Techne by itself never signifies the action of making. What does? Well, that is actually poiesis, making. Techne is that by which one does that. So he says, the artist is, not, is, is a technites not because he's a craftsman, because both the setting forth of works and the setting forth of equipment occur in a bringing forth, that causes, in the, that causes beings in the first place to come forward and to be present in assuming an outward aspect. So what is it that the technites, the, the, the artist, the craftsman actually does? He brings beings out of hiddenness, out of concealment. He turns stone or, or tin or bronze into an axe, a piece of equipment. Maybe he actually embellishes it as well. He shows us what things actually are by making the things come out of, you might say, non-being or at least not being that kind of being into what they, they really are. Now, you know, does everything that the Greeks call the techne uh, fit in there? You know, sometimes um, Plato would talk about the, the, the doctor producing health as a kind of techne. It's interesting to think about those sort of questions. So he says, this all happens in the midst of the being that surges upward, growing of its own accord, phusis. Calling art techne does not, all, not at all imply that the artist's action is seen in the light of craft. What looks like craft and the creation of work is of different sort. Such doing is determined and pervaded by the essence of creation. 
So he says, what then if not craft? If we're not going to use craft, techne, to understand the essence of creation, what do we have to think about in terms of uh, what constitutes creation and being created? So he says, even though the works createdness has a relation to creation, nevertheless, both createdness and creation must be defined in terms of the work being of the work, what it is to be a work. And so he says, we're able to characterize creation as follow. To create what the creator is doing is to let something emerge as a thing that has been brought forth. The works becoming a work is a way in which truth becomes and happens. Truth shows up, comes to light, opens a world up for us in the work of art. So he says, what is truth that it has to happen in such a way as something created? How does truth has an, have an impulse towards a work grounded in its very essence? And he's, he reminds us of something here. He says, truth is untruth insofar as there belongs to it the reservoir of the not yet revealed. For Heidegger, truth, in its essence, also contains untruth, in part because truth is always going to be particularized, it's always going to be situated, and there's always going to be more that could be understood. There's always going to be, a, you might say, a penumbra, or you know, mysterious portions, or enigmatic, ambiguous parts that we may not even realize as ambiguous until we start probing into them. So he says, um, in unconcealment as truth there occurs the other un of a double restraint or refusal. Truth essentially occurs as such in the opposition of clearing and double concealing. So truth, to go back to this, this concept, is going to have to involve, at least in the work of art, the opposition between world and earth. But even in the normal conception, not the normal conception of truth as propositional or actuality, but the deeper normal conception of truth as unveiling for Heidegger. Um, when we realize the truth of something, for instance, I realize that I am in fact in love with this woman over here. Um, there is an openness, there is a, a unconcealing, things become apparent, but yet in that very unconcealing, there are other things that are being concealed, there are other things that remain hidden. That's what he's, what he's talking about here. So he says, whenever this strife between concealedness and unconcealedness, or clearing and concealing, breaks out and happens, the opponents move apart because of it. And that opens up a place of strife. This openness of the open region, that is truth, can be what it is only if and as long as it establishes itself within its open region. So there must always be some being. And when we get to larger, not just conglomerations or, or assemblies of being, but an entire horizon, we have a world. So he says that this is what, what you know we mean by thesis, by, by setting up. So truth happens, he says, only by establish, establishing itself in the strife and the free space opened up by truth itself. There is a sort of self-referentiality to truth in the deeper sense that Heidegger means. Truth consists in, in, in un, unconcealing, right? So something is unconcealed. That produces an open region. Within that open region, there can be the strife between unconcealment itself and the concealing that is still taking place all around it and within it. That is truth for Heidegger. That's something that's very difficult, I think, to wrap your head around. It takes some, some thinking in order to do. Um, but it is possible, and it does actually make sense. So I would suggest at this point, if, if you're puzzled about what that is, rewind the video just a little bit to go back over that, that portion. So he says, um, because truth is the opposition of clearing and concealing, there belongs to it what is here to be called establishing. And this is going to be another key idea for him. But truth does not exist in it beforehand somewhere among the stars. Truth has to happen. Truth has to come into being itself. 
So he says, clearing of openness and establishment in the open region belong together. They are the same single essence of the happening of truth. And he says, this happening is historical in multiple ways. Now here, he is going to tell us about a number of different ways in which truth can actually come into being as historical. This is a very important movement right here. We not only want to ask ourselves, what are the different modes of historical being by which truth answers this impulse within its very essence to intrude itself through the working of a worker, a creator, a founder, through foundation, to bring truth into being, to carry out the clearing that he's talking about. Heidegger is not going to confine himself here to discussing works of art. He's going to think about other analogous foundings. Another thing to keep in mind as we go through this list is this is not necessarily an exhaustive list of the possibilities or even the historical actualities of the advent the coming to be of truth in, in the clearing. So he says, one essential way in which truth establishes itself in the beings it has opened up is truth setting itself into work, a work of art. Another way in which truth occurs is the act that founds a political state. It's a very interesting thing for Heidegger to say the act that founds a political state. And this is fraught with all sorts of problems and, and possibilities because which act do you actually decide constitutes the one which establishes a historical state? That's always a, a problematic question, you know. For the American state, was it the Constitution? Is it the, say, Articles of Confederation before? Is it the Declaration of Independence? Is it, is it something else? Perhaps, you know, Thomas Paine's Common Sense or, you know, something like that. It's difficult to say precisely when that happens, but you notice that every state has its origin stories. It has its narrative of how this founding took place. It says, still another way in which truth comes to shine forth is in the nearness, is the nearness of that which is not simply a being, but the being which is most in being. The being which is most in being. When somebody has an encounter with being, and they may not use the word being for this, they may use the word the divinity, the gods, strife, fate, primal truth, then the nature of, of reality itself. But those are cases where if somebody is able to communicate that, they're able to give us a glimpse into what it is that truth took on, what shape truth took on historically for them. Um, still another way in which truth grounds itself is the essential sacrifice. That's a really interesting thing to say. Where, what happens in a sacrifice? This is not spelled out here. When you have a sacrifice, one thing is put in place of another, and it's only truly a sacrifice if what is sacrificed is at the same time recognized as not being as good or as valuable as that which it is sacrificed for, but at the same time as being of value, as being good, as being a loss in the process. Still another way in which truth becomes is the thinker's questioning, which is the thinking of being names, being, and its question worthiness. Of course, this is Heidegger, right? <laughs> in being and time, posing the question of being for the very first time in its full originality. Uh, but could this be other philosophers as well? I think so. By contrast, he says, science. Science is not original. Science is not an original happening of truth, but always the cultivation of a domain of truth already opened, specifically by apprehending and confirming that which shows itself to be possibly and necessarily correct in that field. Very interesting conception of science. Science is something derivative. Science is something uh, 
less primordial. It is a distinctively human attitude, distinctively human activity within the world, but what it does is it messes around with beings that it's already come to know. It doesn't actually do something foundational. Um, so that's a very interesting thing to think out. So he says, when and insofar as science passes beyond correctness and goes on to a truth, which means that it arrives at the essential disclosure of beings as such, quits being science, what does it become? Philosophy. So, you know, you nece don't necessarily have to think of this in terms of the natural sciences, which led to all sorts of technology. Think of the social sciences. When the psychologist quits, to, quits working with the, within the framework of the categories that he's already established and taken for granted and has been you know, able to, to measure or to qualify and quantify in different ways and derive a theory and begins to ask foundational questions like, well, what the hell am I doing? Is, it, is this all just BS or is this really attached to some sort of reality that's, that's actually there independent? of my projection of all these these great categories and this these techniques onto them that scientist at that point begins doing philosophy when the sociologist becomes concerned that sociology may have lost its grounding in its historical development which sociologists actually really ought to be worried about I think um, but that's a whole side note they become philosophers at least philosophers in the making so he says, because it is a, in the essence of truth to establish itself within beings in order thus to become truth, the impulse towards the work lies in the essence of truth as one of truth's distinctive possibilities. So there's an agency here to truth itself, pushing itself into being, pushing itself onto the scene. But it only does so, and Heidegger doesn't spell this out quite as much as I'd like to see him do this, through the agency or the co-agency of human beings, of Dasein. So, he talks now about truth establishing itself in the work, and he talks more about, you know, the, the, the strife between world and, um, and uh, earth, and I, I want to skip through this fairly quickly. Um, just hitting on the key points that aren't just repetition of what he said before. So he says, as the world opens itself, it submits to the decision of a historical humanity. The world submits to the decision of a historical humanity the question of victory and defeat, blessing and curse, mastery and slavery. I, I talked about this in the previous video. World is already affectively cathected with all sorts of moral values which can be contested, which are up for grabs to a certain ex extent, which do require us to make decisions, to go this way or go that way. The world is not something which is totally given and imposed upon us. We help to create the world as the world, and if we can test with somebody else what kind of world it's going to be, we do that within the world itself. So he says, the dawning world brings out what is yet undecided and measureless, and thus discloses the hidden necessity of measure and decisiveness. Somebody has to determine these things. He says, as the world opens itself, the earth comes to tower. It stands forth as that which bears all. And it creates a, a rift. They have this jagged thing here. The rift, think of it as, as a sort of borderland between world and earth, where world is opening everything up, and earth is pushing itself back up through that. There is a rift at the border between the two of them, and it's not a stable place for all time, nor is it completely undecided, up for grabs. It takes determinate shapes. So he says, this rift does not let the opponents bring apart, break apart. It brings what opposes measure and boundary into its common outline. So truth establishes itself as strife within a being that has this rift. The rift, he says, is the drawing together into a unity of sketch and basic design, breach and outline. That's where truth, among other things, establishes itself in this rift. He says this occupying can happen only if what is to be brought forth, the rift, entrusts itself to the self-secluding element that juts into the open region. 
The rift must, must set itself back into the gravity of stone, the mute hardness of wood, the dark glow of colors. As the earth takes the rift back into itself, the rift is first set forth into the open region and thus placed within that which towers into the open region as self-secluding and sheltering. He calls this figure, gestalt. And so he says the creativeness of the work means truth being fixed in the place of the figure. Figure is the structure in whose shape the rift composes itself. This is the fugue, he says, of the rift shining, where multiple voices are all singing together. So he says, in the creation of a work, the strife must be set back into the earth. It can't be something purely conceptual. It can't be something just potential. It has to actually take place within the elements, the thingly elements, out of which the work itself is composed. Brilliant thought there, which really tells us a lot about artwork. So he says, this does not use up or misuse the earth as matter, but sets it free to be nothing but itself. This is how it's different than handicraft. This is how it's different from equipment. The work, and we've said this in the previous video, the work of art lets the material aspects be what they are in a way that's very different than what it, what it is in equipment. You know, um, the plastic that this is composed of, I don't notice this unless it gets in my way. I could take this as an aesthetic object. I don't really. I take this as just a tool. Plastic can be something in which truth happens, in which beauty occurs. But that would be within the work, and that would have this structure here. So he says, um, let's now talk about the creator. The emergence of creativeness from the work does not mean that the work is to give the impression of having been made by a great artist, he says. The point is not that the created being be certified as the performance of a capable person, so that the producer is thereby brought to public notice. It is not the so-and-so feckit, the so-and-so did this, that is to be made known. Rather, the simple factum est is to be held forth into the open region by the work. You know, think, for example, of Homer's Odyssey and Iliad. Brilliant, brilliant works. Um, in part, the product of, of something that Homer took from other bards, reworked, stamped his own genius upon. It's not as if Homer was a big guy before that that everybody should have looked to and said, Oh my God, Homer made this. Wow, now we got to read this book. No, it's the work itself which said, Look at this world. Look at the things of this. Look at the strife between them. Now, who made this? Holy crap, who is that guy? Who was he? What mind? And then Homer, of course, points, hey, muses, uh, help me tell this story. He's not doing it entirely on his, on his own. Very different than the attitude that we tend to have about authors, musicians, artists these days, where we wait, oh, I know this is going to be great because this person has, you know, produced such great stuff beforehand. And, you know, it comes out and we're like, uh, yeah, more of the same, not so good. And we're disappointed. That's because we have the wrong attitude towards art. We're looking for art, genuine art, where it's not going to appear. The creator is the creator because the creator is creator of art. So he says, the more essentially the work opens itself, the more luminous becomes the uniqueness of the fact that it is rather than it is, is not. It thrusts itself before us. It poses itself to us as that which must be taken account of and that which cannot be entirely understood even though it's brought into a region of openness where we see things that we we didn't even conceive of as possibilities for us and for our understanding. So he says, 
and now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. The more solitary the work fixed in the figure stands on its own, the more cleanly it seems to cut ties to all human beings, including its creator, the more simply does the thrust come into the open that such a work is. It shows us its being. And the more essentially is the extraordinary thrust of the surface and what is long familiar thrust down. And he says, this is not violent, however. The more purely the work is itself transported into the openness of beings, the more simply does it transport us into this openness and at the same time transport us out of the realm of the ordinary. Now what does that mean? This is the sort of aspect of what is often called in aesthetics defamiliarization. The artwork brings to us and opens up within being, because this is a possibility for a being, an entire realm of openness, of unconcealedness, of, of things, persons, places that we hadn't conceived of before, experiences, that is world. World also exists, like we said many times, in relation to earth. They have this, this relationship of strife to each other, which is, you know, figured in the rift. Now, in our ordinary lives, we exist in a world, we also exist in earth. Heidegger is saying that what the artwork does and what the artist does is transport us from our ordinary world, our ordinary environment, to a different world. One which could, he doesn't bring this out quite enough, enrich the world in which we live in. So he says, to submit to this displacement means to transform our accustomed ties to world and earth and henceforth to restrain all usual doing and prizing, knowing and looking in order to stay within the truth that is happening in the work. That's a very good point to make. Real appreciation of art requires that we actually put some of the things of the world to rest. So that, you know, for example, if we're looking at an artwork and we're doing it on our computer and we're actually trying to scrutinize it. For example, Rembrandt's uh, philosopher in his, in his study, right? If we're looking at the play of the light, and Rembrandt perfectly illustrates this, this, you know, play between world and earth. Should we have a whole bunch of other windows open at the same time on our screen? Probably not. Should music be something that we just have as background so we can bop around to it? Oh, so nice. That won't be works of art then. To really appreciate music, we have to create the space within ourselves, within our environment, to actually pay attention to what's going on there, to be transported, as Heidegger says. So he says, now, just as a work, this is another important point, just as a work cannot be without being created, but is essentially in need of creators. It calls to them, make me, bring me into being. What is created cannot itself come into being without those who preserve it. The audience, you might say. But not only the audience, the appreciators. And I would actually go so far as to say, with certain types of art, those who continue to enact it. The musicians playing a symphony are not creating something completely new. In a sense, they are preservers in Heidegger's sense that he's, he's using this here. But there is this relationship between preservers and creators. They're both needed for the work of art to be the work of art in order for it to sustain a world and its relationship to Earth. So he says, if a work does not find preservers, does not immediately find them capable of responding to the truth happening in the work, this does not at all mean that the work may also be a work without preservers. Being a work, it is always essentially tied to preservers, even and particularly when it is only waiting for them, or perhaps waiting for them again. Think about, for example, John Donne's metaphysical poetry. Some of the most profound poems written fell out of style. You know, as after a while they were seen as being gloomy. Who wants to read that crap? That was the attitude that a lot of other people had. Because they couldn't enter into that, that world and the earth of what was, was being concealed. Perhaps they, they lost the theological vision that he was interested in. 
And then came the 20th century and the rediscovery of these metaphysical poets, including one of the greatest among them, John Donne. And suddenly, these works of art, which are not really about John Donne, they are the works that matter, they now have preservers again, including myself. I'm a great fan of, the, of, of that type of poetry. So he says, even the oblivion in which the work can sink is not nothing. It is still a preservation. It feeds on the work. Preserving the work means standing within the openness of beings that happens in the work. Having some sort of connection. Being able to see what it is that the, being able to see through the vistas that the work opens up, you might say. He calls this a knowing. And he says, knowing does not consist in mere information and notions about something. This is not the kind of knowledge like what we find in Wikipedia, for example. Or by Googling. Rather, if you wanted to connect it to something on the internet, you would be watch a YouTube video with somebody who actually knows what they're doing and is trying their best to explain what they're doing to an audience. That doing is also knowing. And Heidegger connects here in the, the preservers knowing and willing. Choosing is how we normally conceive of his willing. But there are choices that are made in sort of a luminosity before us. I have this option or this option. We get, you know, the menu. Should I have the hamburger? Should I have the roast beef sandwich? Should I have the fish sandwich? Should I go to that other restaurant and maybe have tacos? Should I perhaps not, you know, eat any of this stuff at all and fast for, for this meal? Those are options. There's a deeper level to willing, and Heidegger is not the only person to point this out. There are other people as well. Um, St. Anselm is a good example. Uh, Dietrich von Hildenbrand, another great you know, phenomenologist, points this out. There's many people who point this, this out. That um, The willing, like he says, the willing here referred to, which neither merely applies knowledge, I know what the options are, I'm going to make it happen, nor decides beforehand, is thought in terms of the basic experience of thinking. Knowing that remains a willing, willing that remains a knowing. Is the existing human being's ecstatic, stepping outside of themselves, entry into the unconcealment of being, capital B. It is one of the most foundational experiences, but it's not just an experience. That gives a sort of passivity to it. It is also activity, but it is an experience, one of the most foundational deep experiences that we can have. It calls this the resoluteness. It says, it's not the deliberate action of a subject, but the opening up of human being, out of its captivity of, in beings to the openness of being. That is what the preservers are doing with the artwork. That's part of what it means to be a preserver. To be a preserver for Heidegger is something very different than, say, being a connoisseur or being a dilettante or being a patron. All of those would be more superficial relations than to be a preserver. The preserver may not actually be able to articulate just what it is that they find fascinating in this work and what it is that, that they get out of it in, in coet terms, in articulate terms that the critic might understand. But the critic might actually not understand, which is too bad because Critic case means judge, right? Might not understand the work of art that they know so many things about, but don't actually know. Why not? Because they don't will and know rightly at the same time on this foundational level. They, they will. They will to write an article about it. They will to go to this exhibition. They will to go over here and talk about this over here. But that's on a surface level compared to what Heidegger is calling resoluteness. So, he says, willing is the sober un unclosedness of that existential transcendence which exposes itself to the openness of beings that is set into the work. Preserving the work is knowing is a sober standing within the awesomeness of the work. 
of the truth that is happening within the work. The knowledge which is a willing makes its home in the work's truth and thus only remains a knowing, does not deprive the work of its independence, does not drag it into a sphere of mere lived experience, does not degrade it into the role of a stimulator of such experience. Artwork is not there to, to, to turn us on, to jazz us up, to make us feel certain things, because it's not about us. The artwork is about the world, the earth, what's going on within it, this dynamism, and we're able to go along for the ride, Heidegger would say if we will, if we know, if we direct ourselves rightly. Preserving the work, like he says, does not reduce people to their private experience, but brings them into affiliation with the truth happening in the work. That means that preservers should be able to recognize something within the other preservers. Again, they may not be able to put this into explicit language, but this is something really key, isn't it? When you run across those with whom you have a fundamental love for a particular genre of music which has moved you, which has opened things up for you, you are sharing something that goes far beyond you and that person, your own personal being, your own little experiences. You're sharing in something like walking through a cathedral together, aren't you? So he says, the proper way to preserve the work is co-created and prescribed only and exclusively by the work. Each work, if we listen to it attentively, tells us what we ought to do to preserve it. You know, another thing that's he doesn't talk about this here is, but is worth thinking about as a digression. You, as a human being, cannot be a preserver of every artwork. And it's not your job to do that. Oftentimes, when we, we become aware through this, this primal experience of the awesomeness of certain art, and that can include uh, philosophical works, by the way. For me, that would include things like Hume's Treatise, and Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica, and St. Anselm's Proslogion, and Plato's Symposium and Descartes' meditations. When we become aware of the awesomeness in that, we oftentimes feel ourselves under this, this obligation of, oh my gosh, this entire world has opened up to me, and I see so many other people not appreciating it. I should appreciate as much as I possibly can. I should give as much of myself as a preserver to the works well, it may be that only one work is actually going to speak to you that way. And that's okay for Heidegger. Um, you could actually be like the guy that I'm, re I'm reading the Moonstone still, and I forget the, the guy's name, but Robinson Crusoe is the only book that he actually gets anything out of. Robinson Crusoe is a pretty good book. Um, it becomes for this guy sort of his Bible. He meditates upon it like a monk meditates in, in Lectio Divina. It could be that, for example, in my case, I am called to be a preserver of the Odyssey and the Iliad and of the Symposium, but not of some other work of antiquity. That's all right. It's enough to find the works that you have this calling, this destiny, this possibility of responsiveness, of resoluteness towards, to be a preserver. So that's, that's a little soapbox digression. Back to Heidegger now. <laughs> um, so he says, um, as soon as the thrust into the awesome is parried and captured by the sphere of familiarity and connoisseurship, the art business has begun. We've, we've lapsed back into everydayness, into something superficial. Um, we don't want to be thinking just of the art's qualities or its history or something like that in the sense of a bunch of data or information. We want to allow ourselves to experience the rift at the, at the juncture, the joint of world and, and earth. At this point, Heidegger now tells us that we can return to what he calls the opening question of this, this essay. 
How do matters stand with the works thing we feature that is to guarantee its immediate actuality? What does he mean by this? Well, we want to understand the thingly element in the, the work of art. Not, not just for its own sake, but so that we can understand what it is for the work to be a work. And the thingly element is not the work or the workly nature of the work as such, but it gives us clues into it. And as he, as he tells us, each of these, these predominant ways of understanding what it is to be a thing, are inadequate to understand the thingly characteristic or the thingly dimension or the thingly feature of the work of art, the materiality of it, what he calls world. Instead, it's its earthy character that, that has to give us the proper perspective. He says, we must aim at the thing belonging to the earth. The essence of the earth and its free and unhurried bearing and self-seclusion reveals itself only in the earth jutting into a world. And we saw that this takes place in the work of art. I'm not going to rehearse that anymore. Um, now, where is he going with this? Now he's going to start bringing all the elements back together. He says, the actuality of the work has become not only clear for us in the light of its work being, but also essentially richer. As we've gone through this, this essay, as we've thought about the nature of artistic production, artistic work, about even the audience, the appreciators, all these, these things, we've, we've attained a much richer, denser, realer, picture of what's going on. So he says, the preservers of the work belong to its createdness. This is a very interesting thing to say. The preservers of the work belong to its createdness with an essentiality equal to that of the creators. Oftentimes when we think of art, we, especially these days, we tend to focus on the artist and we don't focus on those who with, with what he calls resoluteness, this willing and thinking at the same time, are the ones who keep the work of art in its being as a work of art. So he says, if art is at the origin of the work, that means that art lets those who essentially belong together at work, the creator and preserver, originate, each in his own essence. So, art as such gives us the artwork, it gives us the creator, it gives us the preserver, not as if it creates them out of, you know, nothing itself, but it's what lets them be what they are. And in turn, they contribute. Each, each part of this, each part of this dynamic contributes to the work of art, the ongoing experience, the ongoing reality of art. So, he, he says, art is a becoming and happening of truth. Truth, as the clearing and concealing of beings, happens in being composed. All art as the letting happen of the advent of truth of beings is in such, in essence, poetry. Now, what does he mean by this? He says, we don't mean poesy, verse, because we don't want to say that everything is somehow words just like put into stone or put into music or something along those lines. He says, that the essence of poetry, which has now been ascertained very broadly, is something that is worthy of questioning, something that still has to be thought through. What do we mean by poetry? So he says, if all art is in essence poetry, then the arts of architecture, painting, sculpture, and music must be traced back to that. But that would be pure arbitrariness. So that can't be what he means by that. Poesy is only one mode of the clearing projection of truth, of poetic composition in the wider sense. There is music, there is architecture, there is working in wood, there is figure painting, right? But he says the linguistic work, poetry in the narrower sense, has a privileged position in the domain of the arts. Why? Language is its medium. Language is not only and not primarily an audible and written expression of what is to be communicated. All too often, we reduce language, and some philosophies of languages, they reduce language to mere communication. They don't see what language, its deeper essence, contains. He says, language alone brings beings 
as beings into the open for the first time. It is the act of naming, of denomination, that allows beings to stand forth as this kind of being. This to be a hand, this to be a jacket, this to be a book. So, he calls this projecting. Such saying is a projecting of clearing in which announcement is made of what it is that beings come into the open as. What kind of beings are they? Projective saying is poetry, the saying of world and earth, the saying of the arena of their strife, and thus of the place of all nearness and remoteness of the gods. Poetry is the saying of the unconcealment of beings. So, in poetic language, which doesn't just mean, you know, poems as we tend to think of them, but in, in language in its poetic dimension, beings are, are named, they are given articulation, if we want to think about this in the categories of being and time. Um, so he says, language preserves the original essence of, of poetry. Building and plastic creation, on the other hand, always happen already and happen only in the open region of saying and naming. It is the open region that pervades and guides them. So in a certain sense, poetry is more primordial, more foundational. So there are a few other things he needs to talk about as he moves us through this. He says, the essence of art is poetry. The essence of poetry, in turn, is the founding of truth, the establishment of truth. And he says, we understand founding here in a triple sense. Founding as bestowing, giving. Founding as grounding. And founding as beginning. So he says, founding, though, is only actual in preserving. So again, we see that the preservers are just as essential to this process as the originators, as the work itself. So he says, to each mode of founding, there corresponds a mode of preserving. And he, he wants to do this uh, in very, you know, outline form, and he says, the truth that discloses itself in the work can never be proved or derived from what went before. So that's part of what is, is integral to an actual genuine artwork. It's not something derivative. It's not something merely imitative. It's not just following a pattern. Something new comes into to being. Um, and so he says, what art founds can never be compensated and made up for by what is already at hand and available. So founding is an overflow, and that's what bestowal means. It's a gift. When we experience an artwork, we're being given something that is gratuitous. Now, does that mean that it's, it's just arbitrary, just coming out of nowhere? Could be anything. Throw some paint up on the, on the, on the, the board, and now you've got artwork? No, because it has to be grounded. He says, in the work, truth is thrown towards the coming preservers, that is, towards a historical group of human beings. What is cast forth, though, is never an arbitrary demand. It's never pure whimsicality, you might say. Truly poetic projection is the opening up of that into which human beings is historical is already cast. You're anticipating an audience. You're anticipating those who will derive meaning from this. So he calls this uh, grounding. Grounding as bearing ground. And then he talks about all creation being uh, drawing as of water from a spring. And he says, the founding of truth is a founding not in the sense of free, not only in the sense of free bestowal, but at the same time foundation in the, in the sense of this ground laying, grounding. Poetic projection comes from nothing in this respect, that it never takes its gift from the ordinary and traditional. Yet, it never comes from nothing in that what it is projected by it is only the withheld determination of historical design itself. So this leads us to the conception of beginning. And a beginning is never just a leap out of nowhere. Like Heidegger says, beginnings take time to prepare. A genuine beginning as a leap is always a head start in which everything to come is already leaped over, even as, as if something still veiled. So the beginning, on the contrary, he says, always contains the undisclosed abundance of the awesome, which means that it contains strife itself. Poetry, artwork, contains strife with the familiar and the ordinary. So he says, always when beings as a whole as beings themselves demand a grounding and openness, art attains to the, its historical essence as foundation. Now, when has this happened? Heidegger now is going to really bring things to a close by, by 
talking about what we call epochal metaphysics, the metaphysics of an epoch and then another epoch. So he says, this foundation happened in the West for the first time in Greece. What was in the future to be called being was set into work setting the standards. The realm of beings thus opened up was then transformed into a being in the sense of God's creation, the shift from antiquity to the Middle Ages. This happened in the Middle Ages. This kind of being was again transformed at the beginning and during the course of the modern age. Beings became objects that could be controlled and penetrated by calculation. At each time, he says, a new and essential world erupted. A new and essential world erupted. Every epoch of metaphysics has brought with it something new, some new understanding, some new engagement with beings. Where it's gone wrong is it been taking that as if it covered all being together. So he said, each of these was an unconcealment of beings. Now, whenever art happens, he says, whenever there's a beginning, a thrust enters history. History either begins or starts over again. And not a sequence of events in time, he says, History is the transporting of a people into its appointed task as entry into that people's endowment. So history has to do with human beings, with values, with a destiny, with a point to it, with projects, with something transcending us but including us and involving us. So he says art is historical, and as historical it is the creative preserving of truth in the work. So, he brings us to a close by saying, we inquire into the essence of art. Why do we inquire in this way? We inquire in this way in order to be asked, able to ask more properly whether art is or is not an origin in our historical existence, and whether and under what conditions it can and must be an origin. So he says, we can't force this question. We can't force art. But this reflective knowledge is preliminary for the becoming of art. Only such knowledge prepares its space for art, the way for their creators, their, lo their location for its preservers. So Heidegger is saying, this conception of art as historical, as the locus of truth, as involving grounding, founding, all these, these things that we've talked about, world, um, strife with, with earth jutting forth, all these things help us to understand the relationship between creator and preservers through the artwork and through the essence of art. So he says, are we in our existence historically at the origin? Are we at a new origin? Are we at the cusp of something different than the ancient, than the medieval, than the modern? Do we know? Which means do we give heed to the essence of the origin? Or in our relation to art, do we merely make appeal to a cultivated acquaintance with the past? And he closes with a verse by Hödlin, saying, which <coughs> um, reads, Schwer verleist, was nähe dem Ursprung wohnet den Ort, or reluctantly, that which dwells near its origin abandons the site. Um, now, he has an epilogue here, and then he has an, an addendum. I'm going to skip the addendum, which I don't think is very interesting at all. And I'm only going to point out one thing from the epilogue. He's concerned, as he brings this to, to a, a final close in the epilogue, with whether we're at a time where we can finally begin to, you might say, reappropriate art and not do so in terms of the categories of the past that we've relied on or things like lived experience, subjective experience. Um, those, those exhaust themselves. Those only carry us so far. Those don't get us to the essence of what is going on with this. Those don't allow us to be preservers. Those don't allow us, if we, if we are gifted with the opportunity, to be creators. They detach us from the depths of truth and being, and they thereby even detach us from the experience of the beautiful in its full sense. So, he's concerned, and he brings up Hegel's, you know, uh, point that art <coughs> is, is sort of played itself out. He asks, is art still an essential and necessary way in which that truth happens, which is decisive for our historical existence? Or is art no longer of this character? 
that's where I'll, I'll, I'll end this. That's a worthy question that, that still has to be thought out over and over again. And I think it can only be thought out by placing ourselves productively in contact with genuine art in the sense that Heidegger is talking about here. I don't think that he understood <coughs> everything adequately about art. I think that there's some, some dimensions of it that he, he passed over, that he de-emphasized a little bit too much. But it's a profound vision and a very powerful way of understanding <clears throat> what is going on in the artwork, in the artist, and in ourselves as we come to terms with the meaning of art for ourselves.